Well, whatever season of life you're in today, wherever you're at, would you rest in the comfort of God's promise that He is enough and He will always be enough for us? Would you feel that? Would you rest in that? And let's sing this out together to God our Father.
Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Church Online. My name is Andres, and I am the Church Online director who helps to coordinate our chat host each week. I also work with Pastor John to create our sermon notes, which you can access at WAC.tv, or have a feeling on whatever platform you're on that one of our chat hosts might be throwing out a link right now if you want to click on that. Me and my team are here each week at Church Online to help you stay connected to all that God is doing at WAC. And if we can pray for you today, we've got a team that wants to support you. Just click on the prayer button and let us know how we can help. We also have a special program for kids every Sunday at 9.45 and 11.15 a.m. called Kids Connect. Just grab another device and go to whackkids.tv. This month, we're also launching online small groups for elementary kids starting Sunday, September 20th. Register your children for a small group at either 9.45 or 11.15 a.m., by going to whack.net forward slash events for kids. Now we know it's been tough not getting together in person the last six months, but we are super excited to begin offering on-campus gatherings from the WAC parking lot, Sundays at 9.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. For more information or to RSVP, you can go to whack.net forward slash church on campus. Now, church on campus is not live streamed right now, and we want to ensure the best possible experience for those attending on campus and for those who desire to continue with us online. The church online experience will continue to be recorded and broadcast on Sundays beginning at 8 a.m. with our heritage team and then at 9.30, 11, and 5 p.m. with Union Creative. One of the exciting things we're doing on September 20th and 27th is providing an opportunity to get baptized. Now we have limited space, so you're going to want to go to whack.net forward slash baptism and sign up if you want to get baptized and proclaim to the world that your hope and peace is in Jesus Christ alone. This will be a part of our church on campus experience on those Sundays, and then we'll share that as a video for our church online community in the weeks that follow so you won't miss out. Now in just a moment, our senior pastor will be kicking off our brand new series on the life of Daniel. And as he closes his message today, he's going to be leading us in a time of communion. So I wanted to give you a heads up in case you wanted to grab a cracker, grab some bread or some juice or whatever you have. We'll make it work and we'll remember together the great love of our Savior for each and every one of us. Now, right now, I'm going to go ahead and pray for our gifts to God. No pressure, um, but if you would like to give uh, financially, you can go ahead and do that by visiting our website or going to whack.tv or you can also just text WACK, W-A-C-C, to 77977. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so thankful for your love and your grace and your provision. God, for the opportunity for us to give financially to building your kingdom. God, would you be in these next moments together as we prepare to dig into your word and learn about Daniel and see all that you have for us today. We're so thankful for the love that you give so freely. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we go. Get your sermon notes ready. It's week one of Daniel. Welcome everyone to Church Online. I'm so glad you're joining us this weekend. My name's John and today we are starting a series on the book of Daniel and I'm so excited to dive into this with you. I was driving in my car this past week and started to get overwhelmed at all that we're facing in our region right now. Uh, the, the wildfires that continue to rage, uh, the, the heat waves, the viruses, and on top of that, adding in the personal pain and tragedy that I know many of you are experiencing. And this question flashed in my head, like, is the end around the corner right now? 
Is there any hope on the horizon during this time? One of my friends this week reminded me, but at least California still has in and out which I think is really, really great. But maybe you're in a place like that these days. And if you are, where you wonder, how do I find hope in, in times of difficulty? The book of Daniel, I think, is going to be so encouraging for us. You see, the unique storyline and prophecy of this book reminds us that God is not surprised by anything taking place in our world right now. And in the midst of the challenges we face, it's possible to hold on to courage and integrity because God is holding on to us. So as we dive into studying this book, I also want to share with you uh, two other resources that are encouraging me in my study. Uh, one of them is a commentary written by Dr. Ron Pierce, who's actually a member in our church family. Ron was one of my professors, uh, my professor of Old Testament. So if I say anything incorrect about the book of Daniel in this series, blame Ron, not, not really. You know, if I say anything right about the book of Daniel, it's probably his wisdom, and uh, I'm real indebted to his commentary in this. And another resource I'm reading is Thriving in Babylon by Dr. Larry Osborne as well, uh, who helps point out some great themes about living in our modern world today and some of the challenges we face and some similarities that might go back to the, the challenges Daniel faced. So if you're looking for other resources to, to dig into, these are great ones. But the book I want to really read with you today is this one, the Bible. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Daniel chapter one, starting in verse one, as we begin our journey. Uh, and as you're turning there, I want to point out, we have much to learn about the faithfulness of Daniel's example throughout this book. But what I'm really hoping changes you in our study is the faithfulness of God, who's working behind the scenes in all different types of circumstances. So let's begin reading about that today in Daniel chapter one, starting in, this, in verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off, to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his royal officials, uh, to, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned these young men a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these, from, some from Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of the Lord my king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men uh, who eat the royal food and treat your officials in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away the choice food and the wine, and everybody had to drink, eat vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to uh, bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Dan Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service and every matter of wisdom and understanding which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. 
and Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Friends, this is the beginning of God's remarkable work in this man, Daniel. And as we begin this series today, I want to ask for you to try to picture Daniel with me. Try to picture Daniel as a young man. Uh, he was one of the, the brightest and best of Israel. Uh, we know a fair bit about him just from the first chapter. Uh, we know that he was from a family of, of high social standing. Uh, physically, he was flawless without physical defect. And he was also a strikingly handsome man. So if my wife were to share a picture of how she might imagine Daniel, uh, she might suggest to you to think of Ryan Reynolds, who she thinks is handsome. Personally, I don't see it. So if you can, try to picture someone like Ryan, Ryan Reynolds, but only more handsome and charming. Uh, we also know Daniel was bright. Uh, he was, had an aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed. He was quick to understand, and he was qualified to serve in the king's palace. High IQ, high EQ. Uh, you see, this is a young man who he had the whole world out there in front of him. In Judah, his home, I mean, if he would have lived there his whole life, he would have had a great education, a successful career. He would have married perhaps a woman from another noble family, occupied a respected place in the temple. Life was right out there in front of him. It was positive and great things ahead for him and for God's people. But then life didn't turn out the way Daniel planned. You see, there's this whole world of heartbreak just in the very first verse of the book of Daniel when we read Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Friends, the heartbreak of this statement is that long, long time before this, God made a promise to a man named Abraham. God said, I'm going to establish a covenant an everlasting covenant with you between you and your descendants for generations to come. Part of that covenant is the whole land of Canaan. I'm going to give you as an everlasting possession for your descendants and for their descendants. God tells Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And then you're going to bless the world. God gave that promise. And that promise had sustained the people of Israel century after century. They held on to that promise when they were slaves for 400 years in Egypt. They held on to that promise for 40 years when they wandered in the wilderness. They held on to that promise when they finally entered the promised land in the face of these people groups who were so much bigger than them. They held on to that promise through the ups and downs of the early years until finally people like David came to power and Solomon came to power and they reached what seemed to be the most successful era with the temple being built where they would come and worship God but then after the temple was built and after David and Solomon ruled, there was a slow decline in the nation. The kingdom actually ended up being divided into a southern kingdom, which is Judah, and a northern kingdom, which is Israel. And Israel ends up being taken captive. And soon after that, when Daniel's a young man, now Nebuchadnezzar comes in and with very little effort, destroys all that's left of God's dream in Judah. The temple becomes a memory. The sacred contents from the temple are now taken and put in the temple treasuries of pagan gods. And it's as if Daniel and all that he had was suddenly lost. I mean, again, think about all that da Daniel lost. Daniel lost his culture. He lost his family. He, he lost his language. Now he's being forced to speak a foreign language. He lost his home. He would live the rest of his life and die in a place he never wanted to go. He would never go home again. Daniel even loses his name. And this is so significant. Look at verse 7, where it says, the chief official gave Daniel and his friends new names. Now you need to know they're old names. They're Hebrew names had references to God in them. You see, you see this in, in names that ended with El, like Daniel or Mishael. That came from the word Elohim, which meant God or Lord. And then you look at names like Azariah and Hananiah coming from Yah, Yahweh, the name that was not spoken, but the name that was given to Moses by God. You see, their names reminded them who they belonged to. And now, 
they're given new names. And receiving new names was Nebuchadnezzar's way of saying, you got a new king now. Give yourself to me. Allow Babylon now to define your identity. And in their names, we're not the, the, the name of the God of the Hebrews, but instead we're Babylonian gods. Names like the God Bel or the God Nabu, which you, some scholars think is kind of the ending of Abednego or Aku, which you, you see at the end at Meshach and Shadrach. You see, Daniel's name, his own name, literally meant God is my judge. Such a great name to have. And I wonder throughout Daniel's whole life, if every time he heard his name spoken, it was a reminder, the Lord will set things right. The Lord will see that justice is done. His very name was a promise every time he heard it. But now it's not his name anymore. He's not Daniel. And it looked like the Lord wasn't setting things right. It looks like God's entire promise to his people has been abandoned, which leads to this question. How do you survive when you find yourself in Babylon? You see, Babylon is that place where you find yourself when life doesn't turn out the way you planned. Anybody there this year? Maybe it happens when a relationship or even a marriage that you had such dreams for, that, that relationship ends. Maybe it happens when your greatest hopes for a career die. Maybe it's when you realize that a deep prayer that you keep praying seems like it might not be answered in the way you want it to be. You find yourself in Babylon. You find yourself cut off from the life you wanted, from everything you planned for. And it feels like you're never going to get there. You're never going to get home again. And, and the worst part of this all, when you're in Babylon, you wonder, does God even notice? How could God let this happen? Has God forgotten his promise? How do you survive when you find yourself in Babylon? Here's so what's amazing. Here's what's so amazing, though, as I read the first chapter of Daniel. And it's this. You read that first chapter and you find Daniel doesn't just survive in Babylon. Daniel thrives. Listen to what Larry Osborne writes. He says, Daniel offers us a model for not only surviving, but actually thriving in the midst of a godless environment. At the beginning of his life, you know, as we've seen, Daniel lost everything. Those words, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, came and besieged Jerusalem. That should have been it for him. Yet with God's help in Babylon, Daniel learned how to thrive. And friends, that's what I want to look at with you today, is how can you thrive when you find yourself in Babylon? Not just not just to survive times where it feels like things are off the rails, but to actually survive. And there's three lessons I want to look with you at as we close today before we go into a time of communion. The first lesson we see from Daniel about how to thrive in Babylon is you have to resolve in your heart to honor God. Make your mind up that your ultimate allegiance is to God and to no one else. And to do this, you must refuse to live as a passive victim to your circumstances that are out of your control. In many ways, I want you to see this in verse 8. Verse 8 is kind of the, the hinge of not just chapter 1 of Daniel, but actually the whole book of Daniel. When it says this, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. You see, everything up to this point in the book of Daniel, uh, it seems like the Babylonians are the ones who are making the resolutions. They're the ones determining what's going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar, he made up his mind. He determined he's going to conquer Israel. He determined he would steal the most sacred objects and put them in his own temples. He determined he would steal the most respected citizens like Daniel. He determined he'd enroll them into Babylonian academies where they'd be indoctrinated with Babylonian values and that the, the dean of that school would determine the, each young man's names and, and identities and, and their menus. They're fed that great food, you know, from the king's table. And the easiest thing in the world would be for Daniel just to go along with the program and say, I'm just a victim of forces outside of my control. I'll just go with it. But from verse 8 on, it's like the initiative of the story moves from Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and it's taken over 
by Daniel and his trust in God. And, and you see this in such a colorful way in between verses 7 and 8. Because uh, the very same Hebrew word is used three times in a row. Let me, let me show it to you. You see it best in the New American Standard Bible, which is a little bit more close to the Hebrew. It says this, Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. Catch that word, assigned. That is the same word, again, that's used. That, and to Daniel was assigned the name Belteshazzar. And then you get to verse 8, and then it says this, But Daniel... And it says, made up his mind. It's the same Hebrew word. Daniel assigned, resolved, decided for himself. He would not defile himself with the king's food and drink. Daniel resolves in his heart to honor God. He makes up his mind. He decides that. What about you and me? Have you decided, even in a time where maybe you feel like like a helpless pawn to the difficult circumstances around you. Have you resolved in your heart that you're going to honor God? And I think if you do that, friends, God can give you magnificent courage and strength and wisdom just as he did Daniel. So are you doing that? Maybe for some of you, you need to do that today in a relationship. I think in a lot of relationships, maybe in a marriage, you never intend to drift into bitterness or resentment, but it happens. And sometimes you have to take this intentional step to say, this is not the marriage I want to have. This is not the spouse I want to be. And maybe you need to say starry and you need to draw a line today. Some of you, maybe you're in a season where in the craziness of life, you've just allowed hurry to be the main driver of your life. Or maybe there's some unethical practices taking place in your business and you're just thinking, I'll just compromise along with everybody else. I'll just go along with the flow. And there might be this temptation to think, I'm just a pawn in this larger circumstance that's outside of my control. Friends, you will not thrive in a time like this if that's how you live. Resolve in your heart to honor God. And yes, that takes courage. But friends, if you do that, you will find you're not alone in that. God is right with you and he will help you to become the person you were meant to be. Now, just to state the obvious, all of us live in Babylon in some way, friends. And so all of us are gonna be prone to make excuses. I would obey God more if only my job was different or I would serve God if only I had more time or I would be more generous if only I had more resources. Friends, there are so many excuses that you and I can make of why to compromise. But friends, I wanna challenge you in this season don't, 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 don't let the excuse be about your spouse or your boss or your small group leader. Instead, realize this is your one and only life. Daniel only had one life and he had to live it in Babylon. And friends, some of us right now feel like we're living in a Babylon type time. This is your one and only life, but don't waste it. Resolved right here in your one and only story, I'm gonna honor God above all else. I will not live my life as a passive victim to circumstances. Daniel did this. And I want to point out too, we saw this in chapter one. I don't think if Daniel had not made this choice in chapter one and his friends with him, he'd be able to make it in some of the, the, the future challenges ahead. We're going to see in the coming weeks, there's a point where the king sets up this large golden statue and commands everyone must bow down to worship it. And that's a situation again where these friends resolve, we will not bow down. We've made up our minds. You can throw us into a furnace, we don't care. There's gonna come a time where it becomes illegal to even pray to God in the kingdom. And Daniel still says, I will not stop praying. You can throw me into a pit of lions. I've made up my mind. You'd see, I'd suggest that if Daniel and his friends had not resolved to honor God in chapter one, if they hadn't drawn the line here about where their deepest allegiance was, I don't know that they would have had the strength to draw the line when they were facing a furnace or lion's den ahead. So here's the challenge. Number one, resolve in your heart, I will honor God even when it's hard if I'm living in Babylon. Secondly, Here's the next lesson. Commit to living in community. If you want to thrive in Babylon, commit 
to living in a supportive community with other brothers and sisters in Christ. For Daniel, we see it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Jewish names. They, they ended up being this little small group together. And, and they would go through school together, and surely they studied together and prayed, and, and they faced hard decisions together. They faced, they faced a furnace together. Another, another time later, they'll rule together. This small group of devoted believers would change the course of a nation, but they can only do it because they were together. And friends, in the same way, I don't think you will thrive in your little Babylon if you are trying to live outside of a little community that supports you. Dr. Julius Siegel, in his book, Winning in Life's Toughest Battles, he studied the experience of prisoners of war and hostages who had been taken into some of the worst conditions. And in telling the accounts of their story, he, he points out some of the extraordinary efforts that were made to keep community alive in environments that were so harsh. Uh, he writes about how prisoners of war like John McCain would learn how to communicate with each other in ways like dragging their sandals when they'd walk by each other in a code. Uh, some of them sent this code in the way they'd blow their nose, others through burping. Uh, one American soldier would fake that he's sleeping and would s snore in a code uh, messages to others throughout the cell block. A book came out last year uh, by, by Smitty Harris called Tap Code, and Smitty was the one who actually developed and helped teach the code uh, in the Vietnam War, War in the Hanoi Hilton uh, prisoner of war camp. John McCain, who spent much of his five and a half years in solitary confinement as a prisoner of war, said the most important thing for survival as a POW was communication with someone, even if it was only a wave or a wink or a tap on a wall or to have a guy put his thumb up, it made all the difference. Everett Williams, the longest held prisoner of war in North Vietnam, here's what he said. Those small gestures were acts of self-healing. We really got to know each other through our silent conversations across brick walls. Eventually, we learned all about each other's childhoods, uh, backgrounds, experiences, wives and children, hopes and ambitions. And, and here's what's interesting. In, in Siegel's research, hostages experienced something similar in other hostile environments, like Catherine Koob, who was one of the hostages from the Iran crisis, uh, hostage crisis in 1980. Catherine pointed out that some of the hostages, when, when they were being held captive, had never seen each other's faces. They didn't meet face to face until they were liberated. And yet, even in such circumstances, here's what she says. Just knowing that someone in the next cell cared that I existed helped, helped me go on. You see, all of this confirms what the scriptures teach and what we learn from the example of Daniel. You will not thrive. And sometimes you will not survive in Babylon without deep community, without the strength of others who are holding you up, giving you that thumbs up, telling you you matter. Friends, let me ask you, do you have that? Do you have a small committed community of people, a small band of Christian brothers and sisters that support you, pray for you, remind you that you, it, all hope is not lost, that give you wisdom when you need it? If the answer is no, this is a time for you to dig back in and, and, and to find that group of men or women. Maybe some of you are thinking, I tried it once and it didn't work. Try again. Now, I know some of you, you think, well, you just had signups for small groups at WAC and I didn't sign up. I'll tell you, our, our small groups team is amazing. And if you wanted to reach out to, to Pastor Chris Cox, we can still find a group for you even during this time. And for those of you who, who are small group leaders or Bible study or rooted leaders, I wanna tell you guys something. So listen closely. Friends, the people in your group are living in their own Babylons right now. And they're feeling beaten up in different ways throughout their week. I think there are people in our church family who right now are probably wondering, should I just give up? Is there any hope? So if you're a group leader, or even if you're in a group, don't you dare doubt for a moment that your encouragement for those in that group matter. Every time you say, I'm praying for you, every time you say your life counts, every time you, you encourage someone, friends, 
people need to hear that code, not just the hostages and POWs. People in our community need to hear the code that they matter and that they're loved and that we're praying for them. So friends, commit to living in community in, in your own little Babylon times like we're facing right now. And, and I don't think you'll, you'll not just survive, I think you'll thrive with that community. That's the second lesson. So resolve in your heart that God is your ultimate allegiance. And then two, commit to living in community with others. And then finally, here's the third lesson. Remember that the story of your life has meaning and purpose in the story of God. The story of your life, including the suffering in your Babylon, it has meaning and purpose in God's story. It's fascinating to me that researchers say the factor that causes people to give up most often when they're suffering is not the intensity of their suffering. It's when their suffering feels meaningless. When they say, my suffering has no purpose or, or meaning, that's when people want to give up. Researchers have also found as they study suicide notes that suicide notes rarely speak about failing health, rejection, uh, finances, or even physical pain. A lot of times, the commonalities in a lot of these notes is statements like this, there is no point going on. There is no reason for me to keep living. You see, Daniel discovered something in Babylon that there is a reason to keep living. There, there's a reason that he actually would have never known if he spent his own little life in cushy Judah. And the reason is this, is that there is someone who is at work for good, even in darkness, even in the darkness of Babylon. And because of that, Daniel always knew there's always a reason to keep going. There's always a work of redemption that God has ahead. You see, I want to close by pointing out there's a character throughout the story of Daniel besides Daniel and his friends and Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar's servants. And really, it's the most important character of the story. And I want to just make sure you notice this character in chapter one and you'll see him throughout. We'll go backwards in chapter one. Look at verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding. And then look at verse nine. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. And then look at verse two. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Friends, who's the character who keeps coming up over and over again throughout chapter one? And you'll see it throughout the book of Daniel. It's God. It's God. You see, the writer of the story is convinced that God is at work even in Babylon. God is sovereign. As Ron Pierce, Dr. Ron Pierce puts it, this book is not about the greatness of Daniel and his friends. Rather, it is intended to reveal God to us, reveal God to us even in Babylon. You see, Daniel knew what many Israelites did not know. He was convinced that even the defeat of Judah and the loss of the temple that looked so tragic and random and meaningless, even in that, God had not broken his promise. God was up to something in Babylon in the place of greatest suffering. God was still at work. Larry Osborne says, Daniel knew that God was in control of who was in control, even when the wicked gained the upper hand. And God, as it turns out, God loved even those living wickedly in Babylon. God loved even the people of Babylon. And God, as it turns out, loved even old Nebuchadnezzar. And the way we find that out is not only the fact that God sent this young man, Daniel, to be an ambassador to Babylon, but because ultimately God sent his one and only son to the Babylon of this world to save us in our brokenness. And Jesus faced hardship and difficulty and temptation. And it would have been so easy for Jesus to say, I'm just a passive victim. I don't have to deal with this. But instead, Jesus resolved that he would be faithful to the Father's will. And he would go to the cross where he would give his life so that we could be included into the community of the Father's family forever. And right now, as we close our service we have a time to enter into communion, to remember that the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus 
is what saves us. In this broken world, friends, we resolve to be faithful, but all of us have fallen short. All of us have been unfaithful. And it is the faithfulness of Jesus and his righteousness that truly does save us. And so I just want to give us a chance to receive the faithfulness and, and, and forgiveness of Jesus, and then we'll take the communion together. Right at home, find whatever elements that you have on hand to, to represent the body of blood of Jesus, and then we'll take them together in a moment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you even in these times where we wonder where you are. We know you're right here. And God, we thank you for displaying your love for us through sending Jesus. And today we want to again express our gratitude and our worship to you for that. And just between you and God and your thoughts, if you want to receive the forgiveness of God, maybe you've prayed the prayer before, maybe you've never prayed it before, just tell God in your thoughts, God, I believe you made me. I believe that the world as it is right now is broken by sin, not by you. And I believe the only solution is Jesus. So right now, I give my life to you, God. Would you forgive me of my sins through the work of Jesus on the cross? And would you now put your spirit in me so I can live for you no matter what darkness surrounds me? In Jesus' name, amen.
On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for you. Eat this and remember me. Let's eat the element representing Jesus' body. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant. It's my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and remember me. For whenever we eat that bread and we drink that cup, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, that he suffered on the cross for us, but he rose from the dead for us as well. And one day he will return for us to make all things right and all things new. Well, friends, thank you so much for your continued generosity toward what God is doing through WAC. A lot of times when we take communion together, we can give to our benevolent fund here at WAC that supports families and individuals in need throughout our community. And if you would like to give toward that benevolent fund, you can give at WAC.net to that today. Well, I'm so grateful for the time we had to spend with each other. And I'm looking forward to next week as we dive into chapter two. But I also want to say next week's going to be special because we're going to be celebrating baptisms together on campus. And so if you're wanting to get baptized, I know you're at church online right now, but if you want to come and be baptized on campus next Sunday, and we would love to have you do that, you can register at WAC.net forward slash baptisms, and we would love to get you ready so you can go public with your profession of faith in Jesus. And if you want more information on that or on anything else that's coming up, we can head to our virtual lobby right after service where you can connect with one of our leaders, ask any questions you have. Maybe you want to connect with a a pastor or a group or, or someone just to assist something in your life. We would love to help you right there. Well, friends, I'm praying for you and I'm so grateful to to be part of this at Church Online with you today. God bless you.